Delegates in Paris are hoping to put a break on global warming. Scientists here in Japan have been simulating what might happen if temperatures continue to rise. NHK World's Shunsuke Ide has more. Torrential rain swamps the subway station in Tokyo. A deluge breaks a levee on a river. Flood waters inundate cities. Japanese scientists say disasters like these could become common. They simulated an increase in the average global temperature. They set their baseline before the Industrial Revolution, then assumed a rise of 4 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. The results show more rain more often. Take Tokyo. Days with 300 millimeters of rain become two and a half times as frequent. The scientists say the world would have 30 percent fewer typhoons and hurricanes. Still, they say powerful typhoons would develop more often. They say storm surges could overwhelm seawalls in Tokyo and Osaka and flood the cities. The most significant feature of these results is that we have quantitative evaluations for present and future risks. For instance, we can see how frequent and how big a disaster would be. We hope local governments will use our results in disaster management. That expert says the simulations point to more unprecedented weather events. It remains to be seen whether the talks in Paris will prevent those events from happening for real. Shunsuke Ide, NHK World. Radiation spikes in Fukushima underground ducts. December 9, 2015. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant says levels of radioactivity in underground tunnels have sharply risen. Tokyo Electric Power Company has detected 482,000 becquerels per liter of radioactive cesium in water samples taken from the tunnels on December 3. That's 4,000 times higher than data taken in December last year. 
The samples also contained 500,000 becquerels of a beta ray emitting substance, up 4,100 times from the same period. Around 400 to 500 tons of radioactive water, including seawater washed ashore in the March 2011 tsunami, is still pooled in the tunnels. The tunnels lie next to a structure used to temporarily store highly radioactive water, which cooled melted nuclear fuel inside the damaged reactors. TEPCO officials say it is unlikely the wastewater stored in the building has seeped into the tunnels. They say the water level in the tunnels is higher than that in the building and measures are in place to stop the toxic water from leaking out. They plan to investigate what caused the spike in radiation. They say there has been no leakage out of the tunnels as radiation levels in underground water nearby have not risen. Fishermen in northern Japan are still trying to bounce back from the damage caused by the massive tsunami in 2011. In Iwate Prefecture, oyster farmers are staking their future on a new approach. NHK World's Hikaru Urushibara reports. It's oyster season in northern Japan, and some of the best come from Iwate Prefecture. The town of Yamada is one place that is working to rebuild its oyster farms after the 2011 tsunami. Akira Kojima has big plans for Yamada's oysters. He's a professor of chemistry at a college in Guma Prefecture. For more than 20 years, Kojima has been studying ways to improve the water quality in freshwater lakes. My goal is to make Yamada strong again. Iron stimulates the growth of water weed. Kojima submerged bags containing iron plates and charcoal. When iron comes into contact with charcoal, it causes plus ions to seep into the water. Those ions encourage the growth of plankton, boosting the oyster's food source. More plankton should mean bigger oysters. Kojima's project began three years ago with government support. But the tides and first moving currents of Yamada Bay are different from the calm lakes where he conducted his previous research. We'd put the bags in the sea, but they'd be swept away. It was a process of trial and error, or rather, error and error. The local fishermen came up with a useful idea. They suggested using bags made of hemp as it's an organic material and strong enough to withstand the fierce currents in the bay. Finally, after three years, the test batches of cultured oysters are ready to be harvested. For Kojima, this is the moment of truth. It's big, isn't it? Yes, it's nice and big. That's a very fine oyster. There was even better news. They found young oysters growing on the frames for the bags. It is very unusual for oysters to reproduce in the cold waters of Yamada Bay. Kojima thinks this is all due to the oyster's new source of nutrients. Up to now, the oyster farmers have been getting the young oysters from outside of the prefecture. So this is a pleasant surprise. If we can raise our own Yamada Bay oysters, that would be like a dream come true. It could be a ray of hope for us fishermen. The new oysters are not only bigger, they are more nutritious than the usual oysters. They contain 1.7 times more glycogen, which is a source of flavor. 
I want to further enhance the image and popularity of oysters from Yamada so that orders flood in from Tokyo. My goal is to make Yamada a household name for oysters. This research project will conclude in March, but Kojima intends to keep supporting the fishermen so they can promote their shellfish as a local specialty. Hikaru Urushibara, NHK World, Yamada. It was called a dream reactor, but the dreams for the Monju plant in western Japan were shattered after a series of accidents that started 20 years ago on Tuesday. NHK World's Yasutaka Ueki explains why Japan's nuclear hope has only operated 250 days over two decades. 1994. It was hailed as an answer to one of the downsides of nuclear power, what to do with reactor spent fuel. The multi-billion dollar Monju reactor was able to use the old fuel that contained plutonium to power itself. But any hopes for the multi-billion dollar facility were soon overshadowed by safety issues and mismanagement. In 1995, a leak of sodium used to cool the reactor led to a halt in operations. To make matters worse, videotapes from that time were concealed to cover up the details. Public backlash forced closure of the management company. The Japan Atomic Energy Agency took over. But the problems didn't stop. In 2010, a three-ton piece of equipment fell into the reactor and couldn't be removed. And in 2012, about 10,000 instruments were found to have not been properly inspected. This former Monju director was open with NHK about the facility's problems. We were busy trying to bridge maintenance gaps, and that significantly increased the workload of those on the spot. We had no manpower to spare, unable to properly manage things. That formed a vicious cycle, making things worse and worse on the shop floor. The operator also admitted to the government that it failed to adequately assign and train a dwindling number of staff. Last month, the Nuclear Regulation Authority issued a recommendation to Science and Technology Minister Hiroshi Hase. It called for a new operator. We haven't seen acceptable improvements. We cannot fully trust the current organization. A former member of the National Nuclear Commission says there needs to be discussion on the reactor's future. We need to once again debate the real necessity of the research and development of this sort of reactor and at what cost. Then we can decide whether to go or not go with Manju. The Science and Technology Ministry is still considering whether to appoint a new management body to resume operation or decommission it altogether. But some residents are not waiting. They are fighting against any reopening. They plan to file suit against the Nuclear Regulation Authority to shut it and down for good. the government tries to stimulate the economy, in other areas it is trying to rein in costs. A panel of experts is working on ways of balancing the country's budget by fiscal 2020, excluding debt servicing costs. Their major target is growing health care expenses. The panel suggest, excuse me, Social Security accounts for the largest share of government spending, and the panel suggests reviewing a cap on out-of-pocket payments for expensive medical procedures. They also say a current 10 percent ceiling on co-payments for people aged 75 or older needs to be examined in the next three years. The panel suggests working with local governments and businesses to ensure more people aged 40 or above have regular medical checkups. Preventative care is said to reduce costs over the long term. The panel was set up by the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy. It will submit the proposal on Monday with a view to finalizing it by year-end. But government and the ruling coalition members may need more time for discussions given that the proposals would shift more costs to patients. The Japanese British survey suggests machines or artificial intelligence could replace humans in almost half of all jobs in Japan within two decades. The findings are from a joint project conducted this year by Nomura Research Institute and Oxford University. The results say machines could replace people in 235 
Out of about 600 types of work, the jobs include supermarket staff, taxi driving, and security. About 25 million people in Japan are presently engaged in such work, or 49% of the working population. But the researchers say it would be tough for machines to replace people such as doctors, teachers, tourist guides, and others who require communication skills. Creative people would also be difficult to replace, such as film directors, musicians, and artists. The UN General Assembly has adopted a Japan-sponsored resolution calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Draft Resolution 13 as a whole is adopted. Japan has submitted the draft resolution successfully for 22 years in a row. This year's resolution calls attention to the inhumane damage wrought by nuclear weapons. It urges nuclear powers to step up their disarmament efforts. It also invites world leaders to visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki to hear the stories of atomic bombing survivors. 166 countries voted in favor of the draft resolution on Monday. 16 countries, including the U.S., Britain, and France, abstained. They believe the draft puts too much emphasis on the inhumanity of nuclear weapons. Three countries, including China and Russia, voted against the draft, claiming it distorts history by calling attention only to the damage suffered in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says his country has expanded its nuclear arsenal. He suggested it now has a hydrogen bomb. The ruling party's newspaper quotes Kim as saying, North Korea can make atomic and hydrogen bombs for self-defense. It's not clear whether the country actually has a hydrogen bomb. Kim wants the United States to replace the armistice that ended the Korean War with a peace treaty. Analysts suggest he stepped up his nuclear rhetoric to try to bring U.S. leaders back to the negotiating table. The people who run some NGOs in Palau are working to clear some dangerous remnants of fierce fighting between Japan and the U.S. during World War II. They're trying to rid the Pacific Island nation of unexploded bombs. And they're also teaching a younger generation about the hazards the devices still pose. More from NHK World's Shinosuke Kawashima. The island of Periliu in southern Palau is home to about 700 people. Last November, this man discovered an unexploded bomb close to his house. Right here. Uh, it's like very big smoke and uh, the smell is no good. It's bad. The Palau government asked the British NGO for help. Since 2009, the NGO has been retrieving unexploded bombs in Palau. The bomb disposal experts have international experience clearing bombs, and they share their expertise with the locals. On this day, the team are working in a jungle that tourists sometimes pass through when visiting old battlegrounds. 37 millimeter projectile head one, two, put another one there, three, four. Here's yes, they're just as dangerous as they were the day they were made. The team found a meter-long unexploded bomb once dropped from a U.S. plane. The NGO has retrieved more than 35,000 explosive devices so far. The next day, the team received an emergency call from a local elementary school and rushed to the site. One of the pupils had brought an unexploded projectile into a classroom. Luckily, it didn't explode. The team warned the children never to touch explosive devices. So, Neroy, what are you going to do next time? Do not touch it. Excellent. Who are you going to call? You. Okay. Our intention as clear ground is, is to give Palau the ability to respond to that residual threat forever and ever. Palau has some of the most famous diving spots in the world. But there are still many unexploded bombs lurking in the ocean. There is a real concern about the exposure to the not only to the environment but to the our visitors. The Palau government is also receiving the assistance of a Japanese NPO 
made up of former members of the Japanese self-defense forces. Today, the team is going to a spot popular with the tourists who enjoy diving. It's the site of a sunken Japanese Navy ship that is said to contain bombs. I hear that occasionally divers take explosive devices as souvenirs, but they could explode if something hits them. And the explosions are the only danger with these bombs. Poisonous substances can leak out of deteriorating bombs. They are not only hazardous to the environment, they can also give people rashes or make them blind. Bombs with fuses attached could explode, so the team pulls them onto shore. When the team members find bombs they believe won't explode, they seal any cracks with a special material to keep poisonous substances from escaping. Nobody knows for sure how many bombs are here. It will be a long battle to retrieve them all. Work continues to remove as many as possible of these reminders of the war. Shinnosuke Kawashima, NHK World, Peleliu Island.